Oh, and if you guys are interested, I can I can show you what it might look like if you did all the all the steps last night. If you are just joining us, remember to get your attendance uh, response in. I'm glad most of you at least have one win from the week. Congratulations. I realize this has not been an easy week for any of us, so... Again, I know that we just talked about it, but congratulations on making it to Friday. Yeah, I feel like congratulations are due mostly for you who has been talking for <laughs> 80 hours straight this week and somehow still shows up on Friday in a good mood. I don't know how you do it. His mood doesn't change. Like at the end of the day, he's not angry at you guys. Which is crazy because I would be. I'm angry at us. I don't know. I'm not even teaching <laughs> yeah. myself. Yeah, I'm rewatching some of these lectures and I'm and I'm watching myself ask a question. It's like you literally just said the, what I asked. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, oh my God, I would be so mad at that I didn't ask that question. I love your questions, John. I find them very helpful. They're usually like good tempo questions. I can't remember if it was yesterday's lecture or the day before, but I, I there was a time when I was like, wait, so what about this? It's like you literally just went there. I was like, I can't believe I missed, I don't know where I went. Like <laughs> So I would be mad at myself. So good job, David. That's kind I, of I, yeah. I'll say go ahead, David. I, I think like, you know, I realized that I'm talking at you for seven hours a day for like literally the last three days. So it's natural for you to just zone out <laughs> for 30 seconds every now and then, like, especially in this like remote format, like I'm not going to get mad at you for like me having to repeat something and Again, like whenever one of you asks a question, that's likely that someone else was also zoning out in that time anyway. So I'm always, you know, pretty glad to answer that, especially when we're just like when I'm sitting here talking at you for this period, like it's almost impossible to maintain an attention span. Like I understand that. So it's cool. Don't worry about it. Also, I feel like if you get mad at yourself and you watch a video back, it's because the answer is now so obvious to you that you've like really learned something, which is cool. I don't know. I think it's like a cool. I, I, I did feel that, but there was a couple of times like, wait, I just wasn't paying attention there. I think like, I don't know how I asked that question. All right. Uh, should we jump into some lab review? Sound good? All right, so last night was part one. So you should have sort of gotten your project set up, made a flight model uh, to your config database, all that. And then in terms of these user stories, it looks like you need to display a list of all the flights and you wanna display the properties, airline, airport, flight number and departure time. And then you need a form to create a new flight. And then some sort of navigation bar that will let you go to the list of flights and the flight form. So pretty straightforward. And then a slew of bonuses that I had fun doing. Um, anyone want to start with uh, things you're troubleshooting? I'll, I'll definitely will, unless anyone else wants to start. Yeah, let's take a look. All right, let me share my screen. Actually, give me one sec. Let me get it situated with split. And sorry, one sec. There we go. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yep, yep. All right, this is the wrong thing. Um, okay, so uh, where I'm at is. Um, so I've got this all built out okay. um, in the models uh, are in new, um, this right here is my form that I built out. 
Um, I am trying to console log. Sorry, I just am looking at this for the first time since I did most of this last night. Um, did, so, did you just underline something, Hunter? I did. Can, can you go back to new.ejs? Yeah. To do.ejs. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. New.ejs. New, new.ejs, yes. Uh, I want you to look at line 12. Line 12. Um, oh, should this just be to, sl to, uh, I, I think small thing. What, wait, what'd you say? Method. It's a real small thing. You have a misspelling. Oh, I think that's the German spelling. <laughs> a method. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, also yeah. Okay. So that <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> There's a street in Chicago that's that's spelled Gothi, G O E. It's by the uh, like the author, and everyone pronounces it Gothi, but it's Goethe. So it was the German joke. I, stupid. All right. Uh, okay, this should work then. Let's do. Um, um, Okay, so I am going then back to the routes. Do I need this here? Sorry, where? So now I'm back in my flights routes because I, I, I feel like it should be responding with, oh wait, um, sorry, I'm jumping ahead, I guess. No problem. What uh, I'm trying to do is uh, go back to my... You, you might want to get that... Um... I'm trying to get this to console log, this create function when I press create. And right now I am not. Hey, wait, go back to your routes. Uh, yes. And then this, David, is all this stuff here? This is all from the logger, right? In the yes, yeah, all that is. Correct. Okay, so because uh, I'm I'm searching, so the the console log that I'm putting in the create function should uh, I've gone through it. I don't see it, and so I, it's so something's not correct uh, connected correctly, but I can't swap where it is. So that's to... not reoriented. That's where I left off last night. Can you go back to your controller real quick? Absolutely. Hmm. And it is console. I mean, it, it's putting all this stuff into the logger, uh, like the O'Hare, the flight number but I'm not getting the simple console log that I'm putting in this create function. So that's why I'm a little, so the information is on some level, I think going somewhere, right? Isn't. Try console logging rec.body. Rec.body, all right. And you want to take it out of the, uh... The quotes. Oh yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. And then make a new flight. Yeah, let's try it. Whoops. Okay, so it is console logging that. Yeah, so it is it is working. Okay, so I uh, was I just missing when I the the. Um, it could be that we were just missing that. I, I think it was like, yo mama or something. Yeah, I, I, I just fun garbage. Um, check, it, it's it's easy to miss stuff like that in, in with all that output. So okay, yeah, looks like it's uh yeah th there there's your new flight. 
okay, now I just got to build these create functions. So that was what I was troubleshooting. Um, uh, I will stop sharing unless anyone has anything. Yeah, very nice. Um, I, real quick, I think you had a uh, get in your router. I think you might want to uh, render your index uh, file with like on that path. Um, are you talking, so uh, in my... So like you can have a controller called index that renders a list of flights. And I think you have a, um, a route at the very top of your flights.js route router that's just sending a response. You might want to make that the uh, in the route that displays the full list of flights. Or okay. Actions. Yeah. Cool. Um, thank you very much, guys. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyone else? I'm having CSS issues. Sorry. Is that lab tree? Is that lab tree? That lab tree? It, sorry, what, what was that? No, no. No, um, I just want to know what I saw in John. Is it lab tree? It's the um, it's the lab that was assigned yesterday. The yeah, Mong mongoose flights. flights. Oh yeah, yeah. it's a lab tree. Multi-part lab. Yeah, but yeah. Lab only tree. one part has okay. been assigned. So. This is just part one of, of that okay. mongoose flight lab, correct? I didn't get to that point yet. I don't okay. know when it's a deadline, okay. but I didn't get That's to okay. that yet. Okay, but I got it though. Like I understand uh, thing yesterday. Zach, you you uh you had an, a bug you wanted to chase down? Yeah, I mean, if, if anybody else wants to go to kind of get the, you know, no, we, basis we of it, this is just Let's a- do it. All right, cool. Let me go ahead and pull my screen up here. All right, can you guys see my screen? Right. Sir. Cool. So um, functionally, this entire thing works. I can go to my list to see all my flights. I can go and add a flight. However, on my add a flight page, these do not have the styling applied to them that puts them next to each other and the background isn't gray. Um, so I'm thinking the issue has to be somewhere when it comes to linking this page, um, which would be right on this page. Can you take away public and just make it backslash style, sheet, style sheets? Sure. And do you then have public on all of them? There we go, that did it. Did, do you have it on the other ones though? I didn't. Um, I tried with and without it, but I didn't try just style sheets with just the slash, which must have been the problem. So thanks guys. <laughs> yeah. Ian linked a, um, it might've been a couple days ago in the main uh, Slack, like someone who had that same issue. And it, it's kind of like a roundabout explanation of why that works, but basically you're making like a direct link to it. Um, but there's some more information on the Slack about that and why the slash in front of it uh, helps. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I think I just found it here. Thanks. I'm going to look through this now. Cool, cool. All right. Anyone else? Can I ask a clarifying question on this on this lab? Yeah. Um, I looked at two and three just out of sort of curiosity to see where we were going with it. And I noticed, and I, again, this is the part that I'm not sure about. It looks like we're not going to do the UD part of our CRUD for this lab is that is that correct or is does that does like an update? I mean, I know we're doing like, um, for instance, like a tickets sub thing today, so there'll be like updating I, of that stuff. Are we ever doing it for like the flight, the whole flight, or? I'm pretty I, sure. I'm pretty sure we're definitely doing delete right in the. No. Yeah, you, know, you can delete the ticket, but I, I didn't see a I, thing. I just did a delete myself out of just curiosity, but I didn't see it as part of the lab. So maybe David. Knows. I believe that there is a bonus for it. Uh, if there's not a bonus for it, then we don't do it. Okay. I just wasn't sure. I, I just for some sure. reason in my head I was. Yeah, I'm not seeing a bonus for it. So okay, because like I added a ton of actually. Like, so, yeah, we, 
<laughs> so I had yeah, to yeah, yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> in my database, I hate it. <laughs> They're all red. I was like, I can't do this. Yeah, so, yeah. Feel free yeah. to like add your own delete, like if you want. Okay. Um, but it's not officially a part of the I'll just probably just throw it in as as a bonus for part two. Okay. Like I'll just throw that in because why not? Cool. Um but yeah. Okay. I we just to make sure we don't nice. actually cover delete with uh what we're doing over pretty much today. So uh that's why it's not part of this lab. But Got we'll it. cover delete next week. Okay, cool. Makes sense. Thank you. Yep. Speaking of bonuses, did anyone try some of the bonuses last night? Pretty interesting stuff. Anyone give them a show? I didn't do the date one, but I did the other two. Uh is that sort? Sort and then um, departure date being read if it's passed. Cool. Yeah, you you want to show us how you did it? Oh sure. Yeah, and I think it was. I think it works. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, let me share my. Screen. Okay. Can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. So I I just bring this down here. So I. Oops, um, what I did was I added a, a sort function. So it's going to be by the closest departure date to the furthest out one. Um, if I add a flight, like let's do a Delta, we'll go to like Denver, flight number, whatever. And then let's say it's like way into next year sometime. Yeah, like sometime. And submit that. It'll be way down here. And then you'll notice that if, uh, like on July 7th, a flight's already passed, it'll go red. So just to sort of show you what it looks like. Um, so let's see, a lot of it is just EJS code. Um, I don't, I'll see if I checked, changed anything in the router. I don't think I ended up doing anything differently. I think it's in here. Let's see. So I added a, um, date time like a new date here and assign that to the current time and then i basically just checked if the departs time is less than the current time um if that's the case then it'll um, have a class departed which will make it red if not it'll have like no class on it and then it's just passing the date in here and in this case date is just flight dot departs which is what i called the the date um, that you're putting in and the new thing i just did some formatting because i liked how it looked better this is totally not necessary as a thing it's just some formatting um you can pass in as the options to your to local string or to local date string um function so that's just syntactic sugary stuff for me or when not i guess visual sugar i don't know if they have a word for that but i just like how it looks better Ooh, very, nice. Um, very nice and then as far as sorting everything i just wrote a um i just assigned this flights.sort and just did it by um, you know, the same trick we did in the uh, lab, I think like two weeks ago, where we have an A and a B, and we're just comparing um, A dot departs to B dot departs um, with the sort function on our flights that we're returning. So this is before we even do a for each to break this apart. And then I'm saving flights by departure to that. So it's just returning the same object that we had before, except sorted by, um, in ascending order, the date of departure. And then I'm doing a for each for that so that our TDs will show up like in a row, basically. So that's the idea. If there's a better way to solve that that doesn't require it to be like right in line in EJS, I would super love to hear about it because I'm sure there's yeah. a good way to do it, but this is um, the way I thought of it. So I'm glad you're bringing this up. If you look at the intro to Mongoose lesson from yesterday, mm -hmm. you'll be use a model to read data section and you'll see kind of a hint at how you could use an inbuilt uh, Mongoose method to, to, to sort for you. Okay, cool. So you would do this in the like controller area. You would do it before it even gets here. Yeah, yeah. So you, you could you would it would look like a, you would chain a sort onto a find. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And it would be in your index. So you would have your oh, I, <laughs> this is a holdout from uh, when I was trying something different. So yeah, I think I tried to do that first and it didn't work. Um, yeah, and then um, if you wanted to, you can move the callback okay. stuff into an execute or an exec. Oh, cool. OK, yeah, I'll look at that. That's pretty yeah, take a look at the use a model to read data section. You actually see like a pretty great outline of uh, what you might want to do here. Cool. OK, yeah, I'll do yeah. that. Very yeah. nice, though. That was great. Um, could you actually share your screen again real quick? Oh, yes. Ian? 
One I just want to point out something. Yes. So, um, just, you know, generally also, uh, you could also just do this as part of your controller function and then pass this data to this view already sorted if you didn't want to use that inbuilt mongoose method as well. And just wanted to call that out. Like that keeps you from having to do that on this page. Uh, if you're like, then you're just using the controller and pre-building this data there. Um, so that's another way you could do this. Um, on your date though, um, could you tell me if that's going to be the date of the client or the date of the server? the to local string or the new date uh whatever date you're getting so new date new date my understanding it is that this is the user's local time but that's just my understanding of it and i'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> so this is actually going to be the time of the server because oh, okay. this is the essentially this is going to be the server executing this ejs and the server compiles this EJS down and actually sends the completed HTML to our user. We'll kind of see this play out today. I've got a huge chart to show you all. Um, and you'll kind of see how this plays out um, and what data actually gets sent to the user. Uh, cool. But essentially, because you're creating this date on your server, the date is going to be for your server, not your actual user. In this case, they're the same because we're running all of this locally. Sure. But I do just want to point that out as like, hey, because this is running on your server and it's being executed there, that's the date that it's going to be grabbing. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. So if I'm hosting in like Azerbaijan, this is going to mess up all my, if someone's trying to use it in their local area, it's just going to be all sorts of, how would you, right. what's the best workaround for that? Is there just a way to constantly check the user's time or? So to be able to do this, what you would need is actually a public JavaScript file. And oh. then you bring in that script on this page and you go ahead and just execute it there. And you get the date because that JavaScript is going to execute locally on our user's machine. That makes sense. Cool. That's super cool. Okay. Well, if anyone did that, props to you because that's <laughs> that's an awesome bonus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I did just want to point that out, like a yeah, you know no, totally one hundred percent. Like this works great, and you know, like don't feel bad for writing it or anything like that. But right. you know, just like point of clarification in here on what exactly is going on and how this is actually running. So yeah, that's good to know as far as like starting to think in servers <laughs> for sure. Yeah, yeah, cool. awesome. Thanks. Um, I have a question with the HTML. What does TD stand for? I saw and like T body all that. Yeah. Table so, data. yeah, this is all going to be uh, table data inside. So, essentially, a cell um, inside of your uh, TR. So, table row. Um, so, all of this. So, essentially, what we're doing in here is putting every single uh, piece of data that we have onto a row for a single flight. And then each one of the cells in that is going to be like an airline or an airport or the flight number for that specific flight. So this is essentially we're building out an HTML table. Well, David, I actually just thought of another question I have for you. So yeah. one thing that I came in, so what I tried to do for this is I wanted to make it so that if you were to put in like, a, in like an airline that doesn't exist, right? And you okay. were to submit, well, first off, it's going to make me require these fields. So let's just say we did this. Um, oh, right, sorry. Um, it's going to return this validation error, which says like, hey, this airline doesn't work. Um, mm -hmm. But this to me seems like kind of a weird, I, mean, I don't know, I, I had to do a really stupid workaround to make this <laughs> to make this work, I had to constantly pass null to this new flights form, for, even from something that had no reason to pass null, just so that I could have an error that did exist that I could check for if there was an actual error. Yep. Um, what's the best way to use the message in like enums? I know we didn't get to them in the in the class, but in the bonus, they yep. talk about it quite a bit. And you yep. can use you know what you're what you're testing for, and then your message. What do you do with that message? I was really confused by how were you supposed. To, what's the best practice for using that return value? 
so best practice on this, uh, we'll, we're actually going to cover the data validation stuff this morning before we move on into like oh. the actual lecture, but best practice on doing this again is going to be a local JavaScript file on uh -huh. your uh, users uh, that you're sending to the user essentially. So with that, what you can do with that local JavaScript file is do this data validation that needs to occur on your front end and keep all of this information on the front end because you'll notice like right now this is a miserable user experience because mm -hmm. what we're doing is submitting this form and so the form data all goes away and then we get yeah. back this error uh that says hey you screwed up but we're getting rid of all the user data that they've put in and that like that's miserable like users hate re-entering data like of course like humans don't want to do shit over and over and over and over and over like they want to go in and build all of this stuff out and have it work and be happy and if you have an error they want to know about it before they've you know submitted this form and uh so that way we're able to go and fix those errors and then submit the form so that would really be the optimal way to handle this. What you've done here though, is honestly, like if you're just using the backend to do your data validation, it looks like you're following a pretty good practice. Like you're sending the correct error to this page. Like you're at least telling your user, hey, this is exactly what's going on. But again, this isn't like an optimal solution um, and so that's kind of how that would work. Cool. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Because this is, yeah, like you said, this is like a personal uh, pet peeve of mine. And I hate that I made it because <laughs> I was like, well, I want to get this to work. I want to see if I can do it. But I hate when things take my data away after, and just tell me like, hey, this password sucks. And you're like, okay, but what about it? It's wrong. What, can I have my pages of stuff I filled out back? Yeah. So, yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. Great. Awesome. Uh, okay. Ian, one question. Hmm. So what uh, font did you use? Because this looked really professional. What pages? Like Thank I've you. Seen, uh, yeah. I, take I, mean, no I don't know how you can remember that font. Yeah, I used, okay, well, I used Milligram um, for this just because I wanted to try and use a different framework. So it's a super minimalist CSS framework. It comes with a CSS reset and a font and like this purple color for stuff. Um, I kept this blue because I really like it, the, the default yeah. one, and just kind of fleshed it well, out. That but, looked like an actual professional website there. Yeah, like, they, they do a really was... nice job of, of making stuff look really nice. It's just Roboto, as far as I can tell. Okay. Roboto 300 and Roboto 300 italics, so. Okay. Yep. Good to know. Thanks. Yeah, yeah for sure. Really nice. Good job. Good. Quick question, Hunter or David, whoever knows. Um, so I was looking back through the docs on Atlas hosted MongoDB. I'm I'm wondering, did we ever? What did we do to create the table in the database? Does that just automatically get created when we create a model and then add data, or did we ever actually like create the table in the browser? Um, Are you talking about the um, the collection in the database? Oh, is that called a collection? I I, I, I got the... confused. Never mind. This isn't SQL. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no. You're you're cool. You're cool. You're cool. Right. The yeah. Collection. Cool. Um, did we ever <laughs> actually make sure... create the collection, okay, cool. uh, or or was that just like automatically added when we start to add data? So essentially, that's just automatically added whenever we start to add data. Um, MongoDB is going to essentially accept that and organize all of it for us. And they're, it's automatically going to know, hey, you have sent me a new collection. This is a new like data scheme that I haven't seen before. You're calling it movie. Um, and it's going to go in and create all of that stuff for you. You don't have to do any work at all. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else have any uh, questions or errors to um, work out? Feeling pretty good about it? Um, one one question. I don't know if we covered it yesterday. So what what we we're doing with that server.js um definition there with the time, local time stream, David, is that more um is it like where where you're doing timestamp? No. Um so the 
Are you talking about to uh, locale time string? Is that what to you're talking about specifically? To local time string, yes, yes, that one. Yeah, yeah. So that is essentially just going to output our data in some kind of human readable format. Uh, so it's going to have like the name of the day and then uh, the actual date and then the time in that specific location. Gone. But it's and, not a time. And you're, you're going to see. That's not a time stamp. Say that one more time. That's not a uh, time, time stamp. stamp it's. Um, it's it's not, not really, no. Yeah, no. Okay. Timestamp is just, it's generating a created at and an updated at um, property on your, your model. Oh, on the model. Like a template. Like whatever you create. Yep. Yeah, so whenever you create a flight, because you have that timestamps, um, you're, you're going to be able to see when it was created and when it was updated. So it, it's useful. Got it. Uh, and you're going to see us mess with time a little bit today, I believe. Um, your like JavaScript time is a miserable, miserable experience. Your like your experience with time in JavaScript is just real unfortunate. Um, it's extremely like, man, time is one of the worst things. So just know upfront, like it's not a fun experience to have to work with time inside of JavaScript. Question, are, are yes. there any programming languages where it is fun to work with time? Not really, <laughs> but it's particularly <laughs> miserable in JavaScript. <laughs> okay. Because yeah, I've heard the same about like time in Python and, uh, and I've worked and it is miserable. It's, it's I, I, yeah, I, it's like, I'm at least with at, at least with Python, there is a somewhat standard way of working with time. Like there is one okay. way like that the engine will do it. With JavaScript, you have to worry about like how does the V8 engine implement time and how does the Firefox engine implement time? And like you have to worry about all these different things with JavaScript time that just like once you think you have it down, you're like, oh, wait, no, I actually don't have this at all. And I need to go and rebuild this. It's okay. That sounds worse than Python. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. It's real bad. Um, David, I have a question. I feel like you might have answered this before, but when you're trying cool. to set the time, like let's say in the server, how does it know? How does the browser, I guess the browser or the server, honestly, I'm still trying to comprehend. How does it know like <laughs> the actual local time of where the person is? Is it because of the machine that you're doing it on? Yeah, yeah. So essentially, whenever you are, whether you're doing it on the server or on the client, it is pulling that data from the machine that the code is actually running on. So whenever you are like, whenever you're on your server and you're getting the time on your server, it's pulling that time information from the server itself. Whenever you are uh, working with, uh, time on your client, it's pulling that information from your client. That's also one of the things that makes time in JavaScript really hard is because you have to think about where is this code actually running? Um, is this running on a server, which is in a different time zone from all of our different users? So just another like fun thing that we have to deal with. Got it. Can there be an instance where your server is giving you a certain time, but the client side is giving you a different time? Oh yeah, absolutely. Because your server could be in a totally different time zone than your client. Uh, right now, they're all going to be the same because your server is running on the same machine as your client is. But whenever we say deploy our projects, uh, your server could be over in like New York and like you're in Iowa or something. Uh, so you're going to have a different time zone there. So how do you fix that? Uh, so you have to decide where you want your time to actually be generated. Uh, most of the time, the answer with that is going to be on your client side. You're going to want your client to be generating the time because your user is the person interacting with the time. Uh, and then if you need to put that into some weird standardized format, so you can throw it into a database or something like that, 
you handle that on your back end where your server is. Cool. We are going to touch on that like the tiniest bit, but like time it can be mind boggling. So I'm not going to get like real deep into it because I don't want to just like destroy all of your brains. Um, but if like there's some of some of you might decide to pursue projects that heavily rely on time, in which case you're going to have a real fun and exciting adventure whenever you do your unit projects. Um, one question, David, um, yeah. or Hunter. So, uh, like the next command, um, next ar is the argument because it's in the in the function bracket. So that may go to the next request, right? Like skip to the next request. You, I don't know if you remember um, in the you're, error you're, handling. You're looking at your your middleware, right? Um, I don't know. I don't remember if it's middleware or something, but it's like when you do the error hand, hand, handling in the server file. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's just telling it to move on to the next bit of middleware. Next request. Okay, got it. Just, oh, but, um, yeah, it's okay. But I think my next is not active. Anyway, I have to debug a bunch of stuff. So. Okay, well, let us know. All right, um, I think that's about time. Everyone feeling okay about this lab? Cool. All right, how about we go ahead and go on a break? Um, I'm gonna go ahead and give you all, uh, let's just do 13 minutes. We'll be back at 55 after the hour. We'll see y'all then. Nice. Hey Hunter, could I ask you like a one minute question? Yeah, what's up? Need more than that. Can I share my screen real quick? Yeah. So I did what um, I was did what y'all were talking about here and sort of refactored this so that it's happening in the uh, controller side of things. But I'm trying to wrap my head around putting the sort after the render. I know the render is happening in a callback, but right. any thoughts you have that just help explain like how we're able to do a dots, how we're able to chain this sort at the end of the find and then have the render still notice to render things sorted. Yeah, that is really weird. Here, I'll, I actually, I formatted mine so that I'll, I'll just send this to you. Um, I'm, I'm running the callback in this dot exec. So like if you read the mongoose docs, you, yeah. can, you can put all your callbacks inside this exec. So it, it'll run after, like at the very end of the chain. Cool. So. Take a look at that. Is that to me that that makes more sense? Let's see here. But yeah, the way you have it set up should should still work. So I don't find ah okay. Yeah, I'm not sure why that that um doesn't impact impact anything. Like why you can just add sort at the end, but like yeah. in my mind, formatting it this way makes sense, right? Oh, also, yeah. I think this is like the recommended way to, to do it. Oh, so you're actually appending the class in here. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I try to uh, do as little JavaScript in, in the EGS file as possible. <laughs> Understandably, yeah. Yeah. Cool. OK, so then there's the exec, which executes. It just accepts the callback function that you originally had after find. Cool. Or in find. Where's render? Flights is flights. And then it gives a title. That's cool too. Very snazzy. Does, does, that, does that make sense? Does that mm -hmm. help? 
Yeah, the, it's much more readable for sure. I also, I, especially if you're going to add a bunch of different sorts or a bunch of different things on there, like, yeah. Um, I mean, I, you can't do multiple sorts because it would, I think, mess everything up. But I'm sure there's a lot of extra stuff you could do um, as yeah, well. Yeah, you, you could you could limit and. So if you had, um, let's say, so you know, a lot of these things, you could look at your page and you could go, all right, I want to sort by like alphabetical of like flight of airlines, or I want to sort by, you know, flight number. There's a lot of different things that you can then sort by on click. How would that be handled? Is it like a whole separate, um, yeah, how would how would that work if you're, I, I guess, would you, would you be re-rendering the page? Would you have to be going through a full route to do that? Or would they be trying to like, just rearrange things once they're once they're taken from the server are you talking about like so i'm imagining the ui that you're describing are you talking yeah. about maybe a bunch of tabs that do different sort methods yeah so let's say right now i've got like five table headers right i've got airplane airline um flight number date and then i've got well i've got a little trash can that doesn't have a header but um in theory let's say as the user i wanted to click on any of those and have it sort alphabetically or you know lowest to highest right yeah would that have to go through a full route and re-render would you aim to do that on the like i think you, you know, could pass in line? you could pass in the the data that would determine the sort right got it and then just have it be like if this like kind of thing or yeah david what what, what would you say i would probably handle all of that on the front end mm. uh i would do some dom manipulation stuff essentially um or, as Hunter suggested, do the um, handle that where essentially you're sending all of that data already sorted to the client, and then you're essentially like you'd still be doing some DOM manipulation stuff, but at least you'd have all the data already sorted. So all that functionality would be like there for you and built. Mm. Uh, it would more just be about um, okay, now I need to go and display the data in this certain particular way, but it's still going to be like, you're going to have DOM manipulation stuff on the front end to do that no matter what, unless you just want to call the server again and re-render the view, Yeah, which you could totally do. Um, but that would, you know, again, you like that data already exists on your client. So you might as well use it on your client. And rather than like hitting your server again for that same data that your client already has. Right. So I would prefer to handle that on the front end. Um, also, uh, just piggybacking off of that by doing a bunch of queries and sending that sorted data back in your uh, controller, like pre-doing all of that on the server, that's a lot of work for your database to do. You're doing a bunch of queries with a bunch of different sorted data and so you would have all of that kind of just like you'd have a bunch of wasted database queries. I would yeah. prefer to do all of that on the client where like, again, the client has the data. We might as well handle all of that stuff on the client side already. Gotcha. They've got it. Cause I, yeah, I understand sort of like how that would work in, in something like react, but in this model that we have so far, it's just, it's a little bit more opaque. I feel like. Um, as far as yeah. like, yeah, best way to do that. So cool. Awesome. Yeah. Definitely. And in I, I, React, we would go ahead, Hunter. Oh, no, I actually have a related, uh, like best practices question. Um, see, like, you know, in that React app I'm working on, um, in terms of pagination, I was thinking, let's say you have like 500 posts. Would it be better to do like a huge find all when it, when the server, like when everything starts? or to um, do pagination through like limit 10 at a time and just work your way through those results that way. Are you asking me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I you, would, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I, was, I was thinking maybe you were proposing that as a question. Okay. Um, so <laughs> I would, I like, whenever you're dealing with that much data, I would do a smaller data searching in your database and then pull in that information. Cause that's like, I think of how like Twitter and, you know, like social media sites are built. Like they aren't pulling yeah. in all of that data because that would be like ridiculous. Um, that's, that's how I think with like Google too. 
Yeah, that's um, that's how so, I built it. But since there's currently like not that many entries, it seems silly. But then I was like, well, when this scales, this will make sense. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like you would want to have essentially, you know, your database calls can be quick enough to where that's not an issue. Right. Um, like you should be able to make those queries quickly enough and get data back to your client fast enough that you should be able to make lots of little tiny queries as you go. Um, and like, again, it kind of depends on the data that you're doing, that you're using and you're anticipating to have. Like right. there's a lot of cases where just pulling all of your data isn't going to be a bad thing. Like why not just have it there? Yeah. Um, especially with most of what we do in this class, we're like, we aren't doing any like big data type of work. Uh, like right. the biggest thing we would ever do is like call an API. Um, and in that case, they're already sending us all the data whenever we do that API call. So right. we might as well just hold onto that data and use it and display it to the user whenever they actually, you know, make that request to see it. Uh, but we can just hold that in state. We don't necessarily need to worry about like, oh, hey, we need to like hold on to this data and only send it if the user requests it. Um, in that case, like just send it on and get it over with. But uh, like, you know, it, like all things, it depends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wonder, I don't know if you have looked in much into the suspense thing that the React is adding, but I wonder if it'll change how like people do all their like scrolling page loads, you can just have your main page load faster than like the ha second half of some data, which loads second and then then loads in. Like it's, I feel like it's going to add all sorts of really cool, like steps to things. But yeah, absolutely, super neat. Oh, I had one more question, which feel free not to answer if it's boring. But um, the for partials, I was figuring out. Like, I luckily had a situation where my for my nav, of course, it's just going to have the same header title. It's going to go back to the main page, or whatever. But if you were using a partial and it had, let's say, like each individual pages in for like uh, each pages separate title in it. Would you just avoid doing that because it's a headache, or is there like a pretty easy way with the way EGS works natively to just like include that in every page? Is I don't know. I was just trying to figure out like how that would work. So are you saying like whenever we are, whenever we have the title in like the head, and we need to pass the data to the page to be able to like see that what that title is? Or are you? talking about that. Yeah, like you would just pass in your controller, sort of like maybe what, what Hunter sent me, like you would, um, you would just always pass the title. And that way you could, you, you would just use like an EJS like title placeholder in all your partials and it would just like, I'd do it, that'd be like, yep. okay. Yep. I was that's trying to figure that do. out the day and that makes sense, yeah. Yep, and that's what we'll do today because oh. like, after we start in with our data validation stuff from the end of the last lecture, we're going to jump into pretty much just writing a bunch of partials for the rest of the morning after that. So cool. Okay. Awesome. 